Now let's think about the Fisher's permutation test in a more um, formal general way. Okay? So suppose we have any units. We have a binary achievement, T at zero if it's control group, one if it's treated. The outcome is Yi, uh, which is the potential outcome. The treatment assignment determines which potential outcome will be equal to the observed outcome. The complete randomization of the treatment assignment means that we assign exactly n1 units to the treatment group. That means that the rest of the units, n0 or n minus n1 units, are assigned to the control group. This is different from Bernoulli randomization, where each unit is a flip a coin. When you do that, the n1, the number of treat, uh, the number of treated units, and the n0, number of control units, are not fixed. Right by chance, you can get a different number of treatment group and control group depending on the coin flip. However, complete randomization fixes the size of the treatment group and the size of the control group ahead of time. More formally, we can look at the uh, we can define the randomization distribution of the treatment as probability of the treatment variable equal taking the value of equal value of one equal n one over n because n one units assigned. And just for the completeness, I I write it as a conditional probability of being treated, where the conditioning set is all potential outcome of the sample. Okay, so obviously the treatment assignment doesn't depend on the potential outcomes because of the randomization. So this conditional probability is the same as probability of Ti equal 1, which is n1 over n. Okay, so each unit has the same probability of being assigned to the treatment group, n1 equal n. And this notation makes it explicit that treatment assignment is independent of potential outcomes, all potential outcomes, everybody's potential outcomes. And we make sure that the number of treated units is equal to n1. So sum of ti, ti is the indicator variable, is equal to n1. Okay, so this is the formal definition of complete randomization. The sharp null hypothesis, so we call this sharp null because it's a null hypothesis about each unit. Okay, not the null hypothesis about the average outcome. This is the null hypothesis about the each unit, so therefore we call sharp null. The sharp null hypothesis of no treatment effect basically says for every unit, for all i, y of 1, y of 0 is the same. Okay, so treatment has zero effect on the outcome. Okay, so that's basically um, the basic setup of the permutation test. Now let's consider the Fisher's exact test. Fisher's exact test is a bit applicable when the treatment is binary, so it's either treated or controlled, and then the outcome is also binary. Let's call this success or failure. So y is equal to either 1, success, or y equals 0, failure. Okay. In this case, we can represent everything in 2 by 2 table. Okay. We can divide the observations into treatment group and control group, that's the left column and the right column respectively, and then we can divide the outcome into two rows, uh, y equal 1 and y equal 0. And upper left corner, we have number of successes among the treated. So that can be represented as sum of ti times y of 1, because y of 1 is the outcome you would observe under the treatment. Okay. So only when t equal 1, you would count the number of successes. So the upper left corner, represents the total number of treated units that have outcome as a success. One below that, and in the bottom cell, is the number of treated units who have failure, y equals 0. And there we're going to use 1 minus y of 1 because that's equal to 1 only when y of 1 is equal to 0. 0 is a success, uh, failure. Okay. The same thing as the control. And you will see this... Um, way of writing quite a bit in this class, 1 minus t, ti basically is the dummy variable 
for control group because one minus ti is equal to only equal to one only if ti equals zero. Ti equals zero represents control group. Okay, so it's basically the two by two table, and and on the margin we have the total. So the number of treated, uh, total number of treated, which is n one, total number of control n zero, and total number of success we're gonna call that m, and the total number of failure is uh, simply n minus m. So that's basically the setup. Achievement control group, uh, two groups, and success and failure, uh, binary outcome. Here, now we want to test whether the treatment has any impact on the outcome, okay? uh, using the permutation test. So we want to see if we can reject the null hypothesis, sharp null hypothesis of no treatment effect. The test statistic we're going to use is the number of successes in the treatment group, so the upper uh, left corner cell. Okay. Uh, that's basically going to be our um, test statistic. We could have picked any other cell. One, if, we, if we know one cell, then the rest of the cell can be known. So, but for the simplicity, we're going to start uh, stick with the number of successes among the treated. And that can be written as S. I'm going to denote that by S and sum of uh, T times YI1. Okay. Now, what we want to do is we want to figure out what is the distribution of this test statistics, just like we did for the histogram for the lady testing T. That's what we want to know. We will try to um, think about that distribution, that's the reference distribution, by permuting the treatment assignment. Right, so we would, we would ask ourselves what would happen if hypothetically treatment was given to or given to different uh, units. And then we try every single um, possible way of the treatment assignment under the complete randomization. Okay. Fortunately, under the sharp null hypothesis, we know that the y of 1 is going to be always equal to y of 0 for every observation i. And in fact, that's going to be equal to what we actually observed in the experiment. So if you're in a treatment group, obviously yi of 1 is equal to yi. So there, there's no issue there. But even if you're in a control group, yi of 0, under the sharp null, we know that the yi of 0 is going to be equal to yi of 1. Hence, the observed outcome for the control group can be used as yi of 1 as well. Because under the shop now, we know all, everybody's potential outcome. Because we observe either yi of, y, yi of 1 or yi of 0. And since they are equal, we, we know both potential outcomes under the shop now. Okay. So all we have to do is to change the treatment assignment and count the number of, um, count the number of successes in the treatment group in each hypothetical treatment assignment. And that gives basically the distribution of the test statistic. Under the sharp null, we would like to look at the distribution of test statistics S. Turns out this distribution is something called hypergeometric distribution. And you can think about how to um, derive that by thinking of what is uh, how many ways you can get S, uh, the test statistic S to take the value of uh, small s here. And the way to do this is to think about how many ways you can assign S successes to the treatment group and then assign N1 minus S failures, because the rest is the failure, to the treatment group. And that product will give you the total number of ways the test statistic S can take the value of little s. And we're going to divide that by the number of ways to assign n1 units to the treatment group. And this each of these terms can be computed uh, um, uh, using the uh, factorial. And uh, for example, the num total number of ways to assign n1 units to the treatment group is n choose n1. And the total number of ways to assign S successes to treatment group is M choose S. So, so this uh, 
probably the mass function is, is called the hypergeometric distribution. So in this case, the Fisher's exact test, we can uh, derive reference distribution in a closed form. So how do we do the computation uh, for p-value? We can do exact computation. Um, this could be difficult when n is large because it's, it's a large sort of factorial calculation. So we could do the analytical approximation. For example, we can derive the mean and the variance, and the mean and the variance looks like this. And then you might, uh, then you might use the normal approximation by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation and using the standard normal uh, distribution as approximate distribution. And you can see that the moments, the mean and the variance, is only a function of n and m and n, uh, n1 and m and n and so on. We can also realize that this looks like a binomial moments and or risk uh, very similar, variance is very similar too. So we can use the binomial distribution to approximate this reference distribution. So this approximation becomes more accurate as uh, sample size grows. The third way to do this is to do Monte Carlo approximation. To do this, the first step is to fill in the missing potential outcomes under the not sharp null. So for the treatment group, we want to impute the missing potential outcome y of zero. For the control group, you like to impute y of one. But under the null, under the sharp null, we know that the two potential outcomes are the same. So you can easily impute by just taking one of the observed value, or outcome value, as the missing potential outcome. Once you do that, you're going to sample TI according to the complete randomization because we know how the treatment is randomized. And then you use that to assign different units to different treatment group. Once you assign the treatment group, uh, treatment uh, status to each, each observation, then you can compute the test statistics using the four potential outcomes uh, table that you obtained. This can be made arbitrarily accurate by increasing the number of draws, Monte Carlo draws. Okay, so you can uh, arbitrary ac accurate, you can obtain the arbitrary accurate approximation. This is widely applicable, so you can use the different test statistics. Um, you can also use the different treatment assignment mechanism as long as you can sample, you can simulate the treatment assignment. So it's a very general strategy that we'll be using um, over and over in the future. Okay, so let me give you some example. Uh, so this is a famous well-known uh, experiment, the Project STAR. It was a student-teacher achievement ratio uh, project that this STAR stands for. It was done in, uh, in, back in the 80s in Tennessee. More than 10,000 students involved. Uh, it cost, the whole experiment cost um, $12 million. And they're interested in the effects of class size, uh, small class size in the early grade levels. There are three arms in the experiment, the small class, regular size, and then regular size class with aid, teaching aid. We're gonna focus on small class versus uh, regular size class so that we have the binary treatment. And then we're gonna look at the outcome, binary outcome, whether um, students later graduated from high school. So it's either graduated or not graduated. And we'll have this two by two table. And you can apply the features exact test and um, calculate the exact p-value. And we see that um, the p-value is a greater, um, so you can do exact or asymptotic approximation. And you observe that either way, the p-value is uh, greater than the normal uh, threshold, standard threshold 0.05. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis of class size affecting the high school graduation. So this is a sort of long-term impact of class size in the early grades, grade levels on the high school graduation. So we fail to reject the null. 
Now, uh, I want to also talk about rank sum tests. Fisher's exact test is only applicable to the binary outcome situation. But um, there are a lot of cases where the outcome may be continuous. So we're going to discuss the rank sum tests which are appropriate for the continuous outcome. So the test is called rank sum because we're going to look at the rank of the outcome for each unit. So we're going to basically rank the um, observed outcome from the largest to the smallest. And so rank is a function of outcome of all observations because it's relative to uh, outcome of other observations. And then depending on the treatment, uh, the outcome of the other observation may change. So the observed outcome, yi, is a function of the gene assignment. <clears throat> okay. So well-known test statistics is called the Wilcoxon's rank sum test statistic, which basically sums the rank of all the treated observations. So the only difference between the Fisher's exact test and this is that what test statistic to use. In the Fisher's exact test case, we had a binary outcome and we just counted the number of successes for the treatment group. Here, we're going to add some of the ranks of the treated units. Okay. It turns out that this uh, S, the Wilcoxon's uh, rank sum statistic, have the reference distribution that is symmetric around the mean. So that sort of makes it more appropriate for normal approximation. And then the moments can be um, easily calculated under the assumption of non tie. So the mean and the variance has a really nice form. Um, and, uh, and we can use normal approximation to, to get the p-value. And the difference distribution doesn't depend on the scale. So if you multiply outcome by some number or even shift the outcome by a constant, it doesn't, the, the rank doesn't change. And also it's not sensitive to the outlier. Unlike something like a mean, if you have very large value, or very small outcome value, because we're only looking at the rank, it's not dependent on that. So it's a fairly robust uh, test statistic. Um, there's another uh, closely related Mann Whitney U test statistic, uh, which basically is the same as Wilcoxon rank sum test statistic, but it's shifted by the mean of it so that the, the, this U test statistic has a mean of zero. Okay. And then you can basically do the same thing. Um, you can either do you know, um, normal approximation or you can do Monte Carlo approximation. Uh, so the project star, we can look at um, the effect of kindergarten class size on the eighth grade reading score. So the reading score, here's a uh, histogram, the small class and regular class with histogram. So reading uh, score is more or less continuous. And therefore, Fisher's exact test is not appropriate. So we use the rank sum test. So if we do the Cox and rank sum test, um, Although there are some ties and there, there's ways to resolve the ties, which I'm not going to discuss um, right now, but you see that the p-value is much smaller than 0.1%, uh, and which is sort of obvious if you look at the histogram. Uh, they are very, they're located at a very different place, so they're uh, clearly the small class students in the small class has a much higher reading score than the people in the uh, students on the regular class. Okay, so we introduced the Fisher's exact test and rank sum test. These are examples of more general permutation tests. So let me just summarize the general permutation test procedure uh, before we end the lecture today. Okay, so the first step is to specify a Schopenhauer hypothesis. So Schopenhauer hypothesis is an R hypothesis about each unit and how the y of 1 and y of 0 for the two potential outcomes are related. Okay? So you can, um, you can specify that difference to be, say, a constant. Um, 
Typically, we are interested in sharp null hypothesis of no effect, although you could set it to some other values. So tau null i could be different values for each different uh, unit, although typically we just set it to 0 for every observation. Remember that the no effect implies no heterogeneous effect, no spill or effect, etc., etc., like a zero effect. Changing the treatment assignment doesn't change the outcome of any observation. So if we reject the null, we may be rejecting the null because there are some heterogeneous effect, or maybe we're rejecting the null because there are some spillover effects. We don't know the reason why we're rejecting the null, but if we reject the null, that means that there is a strong evidence that the treatment assignment have some impact on the outcome. Okay, so you can think of this as a sort of first step analysis of the experiment. Uh, so once spe you specify a sharp null hypothesis, then you choose a test statistic. So test statistic is a function of the treatment and then the outcome and then the null value. Um, okay. So what's nice about the sharp null hypothesis is that you will know under the null, you know why of the values of both y of 0 and y of 1 for all observations. So you can change the treatment and you can compute the test statistics under the different configuration of the treatment assignment. Okay. So example I gave you is a Fisher's exact test statistic. We also talked about on some test statistic. Any statistic is fine. You can do difference in means, you can do regression, or you can do some fancy machine learning algorithm. You could regress y on t, for example, y of 1 on t, for example. Okay. Um, any statistic will give you a value than exact p-value, uh, but statistical power may differ. So you want to choose the test statistic that is sensitive to the departure from the null, the sensitive to the, um, the treatment effect. However, any test statistic will give you a valid p-value. So that's, that's nice because you don't have to assume a model for the test to be valid. You can use the model, but you don't have to assume that's how the data are generated. Um, so yeah, so as I said, you can use regression models or machine learning algorithms. Finally, once you choose a test statistic, then you compute the difference distribution and then p-value based on the randomized distribution of the treatment assignment. Because we know how we randomize the treatment assignment in the experiment, we are basically using a design to come up with a reference distribution. So we can do the exact calculation in a very small samples by permuting all possible treatment assignment possibilities as we done in the Fisher's um, ready testing T example. There are so many ways to do that. Or you can do some large sample approximations such as normal or other distribution as we discussed. And more easily, you can do Monte Carlo approximation, and this could be a general strategy. And it's possible even if the randomized distribution is very, very complicated. Uh, Monte Carlo approximation can be actually used. Okay, just to summarize the lecture, Fisher called the randomization of the treatment assignment as a reason basis for inference. Let's use the randomization of the treatment assignment as a way to make statistical inference. And this is a design-based approach because we use the knowledge of experimental design, how we actually randomize the treatment assignment, and it's assumption-free inference. We are not assuming the outcome follows certain distribution or certain regression model. It's an inference over repeated hypothetical randomization. We said, what would happen if the treatment assignment were different? Right? And that hypothetical scenarios can only be specified because we assume the null hypothesis. Under the null hypothesis, we can figure out what would actually happen if, um, if the treatment is assigned, assigned differently. Okay, so, um, and it, and so in that sense, it's a sample inference rather than population inference. We don't think about 
we don't say anything about how this sample is representative of the population. It's all about whether the chimney affects the sample at hand. Uh, we use sharp null hypothesis to do this test. Okay. It implies no effect for every unit. Uh, it may not be of interest. You might think that the sharp null hypothesis is not very interesting because how can you say that the treatment has no effect on anyone um, in any way? But it is a it, it serves as a starting point of analysis. It, it, if you cannot even um, reject this null hypothesis, maybe there isn't very strong signal in the data that tells uh, what the treatment assignment, how the treatment affects the outcome. So we can think of permutation test as a general testing procedure for randomized control trials. Uh, it's flexible we, in the sense that we can use any test statistics and we can use Monte Carlo simulation to accommodate any type of random assignment of the treatment. It's assumption free. We don't have to assume a certain model is correct. Okay, that's the end of the lecture.